33. So he did all this research, he did all this thinking, and on the way to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in the Uber, what is he doing? Remember, they're talking about executive function. What is he doing? And it's introducing evidence. Look at it. He is having a two, well, actually, it's a three-way because he's involved with two other people. He's trying to get and talk, text, not talk, but text, to uh, Angie, Angie uh, Gilmartin, who's not at Marjorie Stoneman. She's at another school. And she says, look, I'm busy. I'm at school. I'll talk to you later. And then he's also texting uh, J.T. Jameson, uh, Jameson uh, Sneed, who he was living with that family about having a party and having girls over. So he's having this conversation on his way, his texting conversation, to do two different people while he's on his way. And he tells J.T. Sneed what? Can you get the girls there? Uh, where are you going? I'm going to the movies. I'm not going to work. I don't uh, go to school on Valentine's Day. And I'm going to call my employer and tell them I'm not coming, but I'm going to the movies. All the way, on the way uh, to accomplish his plan. So he arrives at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School at 2.19 p.m. He gets out of the back seat of Mr. Keeney's uh, Uber, uh, I think it was a RAV4, and he directly goes to the 1200 building east exit. Uh, you've been there, so you know that's the, the closest, the cl that, we're, uh, that pedestrian gate is the closest exit or entrance to the 1200 building. So he goes into the east uh, double doors and immediately makes a right in, into the east stairwell. And as he takes out uh, his AR-15 style rifle, that Smith & Wesson 5.5 Smith M&P 15, takes it out of uh, the Gabella rifle bag, uh, in walks Christopher uh, McKenna. Christopher McKenna was a student who was in 1216, in classroom 1216. He was out on the pass, and he walks into the stairwell and face to face to Nicholas Cruz, and Cruz says to him, you better get out of here, something bad is about to happen. So Christopher McKenna runs, and he goes to get one of the school monitors, Aaron Feist. So he steps, Cruz steps out of the uh, east stairwell, and in, in, the, and in the east stairwell now, there are four students. Ashley Baez is walking west in the hallway, Gina Montaldo uh, was sitting on the floor. She got permission from her teacher, uh, Miss Matlock, uh, to, to work on it. It was more quiet in the hallway, to sit in the hallway right in front of classroom 1215 and work on her computer. And standing beside her, knocking on the door to 1215 to get back into classroom 1215 because they had, had uh, passes to go somewhere else, uh, was Luke Hoyer and Martin Duque Aquiano. They were students in 1215, and they were knocking on the door uh, to get back in. Cruz steps out of the stairwell, fires and hits in the leg, Ashley Baez. And maybe you can remember from uh, the video that she uh, runs across the hall and runs into classroom 1210. He fires at Gina, uh, Luke, and Mark. Then he goes over to classroom 1216. 1216, classroom 1216, if you recall, is the second classroom on the north part of the, on the north side of the hall. It's the second classroom as you come in the east double doors. So he fires into classroom 1216, it shatters the glass, and he fires and he hits. Uh, uh, Alex, uh, uh, Alex Schacht, uh, Schachter, who was getting up from his desk, he hits him twice in the chest. Alex was 14 years old, got shot twice in, twice in the chest, and he died of, of his wounds. Cruz fires into 1216, then he walks away right next to 1216. He kneels on the ground, he takes off his backpack, he unzips it and brings out his tactical vest with the 10 magazines in it. He puts the vest on. 
He takes out the 10 round magazine, lays it on the ground, pulls out a magazine from the vest and puts a new magazine uh, in, into the gun. Then he walks over to classroom 1214 and 1215. 1215 is the second classroom on the south side of the hall from the east uh, double door entrance. And on the south side, 1214 and 1215's here. Uh, the, first, the first classroom coming in is 1218. Then there's 1215 and then there's 1214. And 1214 and 1215 abut, they're right next to each other. And that's where Gina and Luke and Martin are. So he fired, he walks up there and fires into them, wounding them. He then fires into classroom 1214, which was the Holocaust class. He hits Helena Ramsey. Helena Ramsey was 17 years old. He shoots her four times, killing her. He shoots and kills Nicholas Dorette, who was 17. He shots, shoots and kills him, shoots him three times. He wounds Samantha Brady, Samantha Fuentes, uh, Isabel Checker, and Danielle Menescu. Then he walks back to 1216 and fires additional shots into 1216. This time he killed, shoots and kills Elena Petty. Elena Petty was shot four times and she died of her wounds. He shoots and kills Alessa Alphadeth. She shot eight times and she died of her wounds. He also wounded William Olson, Justin Colton, Genesis Valentin, uh, Alexander Durrett, who's the brother of Nicholas Durrett, who was just shot and killed over in 1214, and Keshava Magaporium. So there was five people he wounded in 1216. Then he moves west, and as he's moving west, in comes the athletic director, uh, school monitor, Christopher Hickson. He runs through the west doors. And when he runs through the west doors, the defendant, Nicholas Cruz, shoots him twice, once in the uh, torso and once in the leg. Christopher Hickson falls to the ground and crawls over to the north side of the hall to an alcove uh, near the west door and double door entrance. And he's seeking, you know, cover, shelter. The defendant continues west. And when he comes up to 1215 again, he shoots into Gina again, Martin again, and Luke again. And Gina, and you saw the photographs, you remember the, the testimony of Dr. Osborne, the medical examiner? He did the autopsy on Gina Montalvo. She was shot four times, and she died of her wounds. But two of those wounds, two of those wounds were contact wounds contact wounds, which means the end of that M&P 5.56 AR-15 style rifle was right up against her chest and right up on her abdomen. Right on her skin. She was shot four times and she died. And she also had what uh, Dr. Osborne called a defensive wound. What's a defensive wound? When someone tries to protect themselves by raising their legs or their hands, Joaquin Oliver had one too, if you'll recall. Gina had a bullet that went through the back of her hand and came out her palm, as if holding up to protect herself. She had a contact wound of her chest and her abdomen. She died of her wounds. And do you remember what one of the YouTube comments from Nicholas Cruz was? Remember? I don't mind shooting a girl in the chest. That's exactly what he did to Gina Montalvo. Then he walks, after he shoots into uh, Luke and uh, Martin and, and Gina, he proceeds to uh, 1213. 12 thir classroom 1213 is the next classroom as you proceed west on the north side of the hall next to 1216. He fires into 1213, and when he fires into 1213, he shoots and kills Carmen Chentra. He hits one of the shots, hit her in the head, 
and then she died of her wounds. He wounds Madeline Wilford, Samantha Mayer, and Benjamin Wickander. Then he proceeds west, and as he's proceeding west, he passes on the north side of the hall, Christopher Hickson. And I'm going to show the video. He turns and fires a third shot into Christopher Hickson, uh, and Christopher Hickson died of his wounds. Christopher Hickson was 49 years old. The defendant then walks in, walks to the interior door that leads into the west stairwell, and as he enters the west stairwell, here's Aaron Feist. Aaron Feist is the is a coach, and he was um, a, a school <coughs> monitor that Christopher McKenna ran to get. And uh, Coach Feist opens up the outside door uh, to the st west stairwell, just as Cruz enters the stairwell from the interior door, Cruz turns and fires and hits Christopher, uh, uh, Coach Weiss, twice in the chest, killing him. Coach Weiss was 37 years old. He died of his rooms right there outside that west stairwell door. Cruz then goes up to the second floor and uh, goes up the, on the west stairwell to the second floor looking for more targets. Now, the students and teachers on the second floor had heard the shots from the first floor. The defendant fired 70, I want to say that again, the defendant fired 70 shots on the first floor and two shots in the west stairwell at Coach Vice. You talk about finger tapping. And, and you heard, heard it. He fired 70 shots on the first floor. So he goes up to the second floor. The teachers and, to, uh, the teachers and students had heard uh, the sound. So now they're taking precautions, a code red, for an active shooter. So they turn off the lights. They get away from the door. They're, they're hiding. And they're, as you know, there's 10 classrooms on the first floor, 10 on the third floor, and second floor, 10 on the third floor. So the 10 classrooms on the second floor, three of those classrooms were empty. Uh, the defendant fired six shots on the second floor. He couldn't find any targets. He fired into classroom 1231, which was empty, and 1234, which was empty. So he goes the length of the hallway after firing the six shots, and now he's at the east stairwell. So he goes up the east stairwell. Now, the students and teachers on the third floor, didn't hear, they heard some noises, but they weren't as distinct as what the teachers and students heard on the second floor. So they, uh, at, at 2.22.38, 2.22.38, the fire alarm went off. And remember we talked about the evidence was that the dust from the ceiling tiles, because of the percussion of the defendant firing his weapon on the first floor 70 times, caused the ceiling tiles to pop up. And when the ceiling tiles popped up, dust came down. And you saw it on the video, the dust looks like smoke. So the camera system doesn't know the difference between dust and smoke. So it sounded at 220, uh, 238. So the, the teachers and, and the students on the third floor, when they hear the fire alarm at, at 222.38, uh, they evacuate. They didn't hear the shots like the students and teachers on the second floor. So they, and, and as you know, there's a stairwell on the east side and there's a stairwell on the west side, so the students and teachers started to evacuate. But once they started, the students started to evacuate, they heard the shots on the second floor, so, and you saw it on the video, they all come running back. And there's a mishmash, everybody running and trying to get, get somewhere. Meanwhile, the defendant is coming up the east stairwell. And as he comes up the east stairwell and opens the door, the first classroom on the east side, on the nor uh, north part of the hallway, is 1256. And that's Scott Beagle's classroom. He's a ge he was a geography teacher. So he is holding the door open. And you can see it on the video. He's holding the door open for his students so they can get into the classroom. And the teacher next to him in 1255 was Stacy LaPelle. She was the English teacher right next to him. She's also ho holding the door open for students, not just their students, any students, to run into the classroom for safety. 
So when Cruz comes in out of the stairwell, he fires four shots into the back of 35-year-old Scott Beagle and kills him. Scott Beagle died right there. He also fired and wounded Stacy LaPell. The defendant continues to fire down the hallway. He hits and wounds Meadow Pollock and Carol Logren, and they run and they hide in the alcove of classroom 1249. He shoots and wounds uh, Anthony Borges, Kyle Lehman, and Marion Kapachenko, who were in the hallway. He continues to move west, and as he's moving west, he fires again. This time, the students are, are running to the west stairwell. He hits in the leg Joaquin Oliver, who runs into the alcove of the men's restroom on the north side of the hallway. He shoots and he hits Peter Wang, who falls on the southwest corner, right next to the west stairwell door. And he hits and kills Jamie Guttenberg. Jamie Guttenberg is running to the west stairwell. And as she runs, he shoots her and hits her in the back. In the back, right near her neck, it severs her spinal cord. I don't know if you remember Dr. Osborne's testimony. She falls through the west stairwell door and falls onto the uh, third floor landing on the west stairwell. The defendant continues west, and you'll see it on the video. He turns and aims into Meadow Pollock and Carol Logren. Carol Logren was shot three times. She's 14 years old, and she died of her wounds. Meadow Pollock was shot six times, and she was in the alcove with Kara. Uh, she was 18 years old. She died of her wounds. Then the defendant goes over it to the uh, men's west room alcove where Joaquin Oliver is, and he fires into Joaquin Oliver. Joaquin Oliver was shot four times, 17 years old. He died of his wounds. Remember the, the testimony of Dr. Topps, the medical examiner? He said there was a defensive wound, that the bullet went through the palm of the right, of the palm of his right hand, exited the back of his right hand, and entered into uh, Joaquin Oliver's left temple and, and killed him. And then leaves from the west, uh, the restroom on the west side, and proceeds down to uh, Peter Wang. And you saw in the video that uh, Peter Wang was laying on the ground. And remember when the kids were running out, students were running out, you can see him moving. So when he's laying on the ground, what? He's still alive, right? Because he's moving. Cruz walks up to Peter Wang and shoots him in the head four times. Peter Wang was shot 12 times. And you remember what the defendant told, uh, I think it was Dr. Denny, could have been Dr. Scott, that when he shot Peter Wang, his head blew up like a watermelon. Remember that? He was shot four times in the head. Peter Wang died of his wounds. The defendant then goes over and he looks out the west stairwell door, that little window in the door. And then he doesn't go down the stairwell. He goes into 1240. He shoots the glass out, shatters the glass, reaches in, opens the door, and now he's in 1240, the teacher's lounge. Why is he in 1240? Because of what I was talking about before. He, the west Windows look over the, uh, the west part of the campus, and the south windows look over the south part of the campus. On the south side, there's a courtyard. On the west, there's walkways and there's parking lots. The defendant fired his AR-15 five times out of the west window and five times out of the south window looking for targets. He left a 40-round empty magazine on the desk in 1240, and he left uh, 1240 after firing those 10 rounds. So up on the third floor, he fired 51 rounds in the third floor and another 10 rounds in uh, 1240. So that's 61 rounds he fired on the third floor. The 10 in 1240 and the 51 
you know, outside of 1240. So you got a total of 139 rounds that the defendant fired in the 1200 building on uh, February the 14th, 2018. So he goes out of, of, of 1240, he passes the body of Peter Wang, opens up the door, it's on the third floor landing, laying there uh, dead is um, Jamie Guttenberg. He takes off his vest, lays it on the third floor landing, take, puts his rifle down next to it, and he runs down the stairs and exits the west doors uh, to the 1200 building. He runs south and then west. Uh, he runs west and then south uh, by the tennis courts. And as he's running south, what does he do? He blends in with all the students and the teachers who are evacuated. Oh, he's got his JROTC polo shirt on, blended right in. As a matter of fact, he bumps into Nicolette Muccietta. Remember her testimony? She sees him, and she hadn't seen him in a while, but she knew him from school, and she says to him, hi. He responds, hi. Uh, plans for she says to him, plans for college? Defendant responds, somewhere in Florida. Then he walks to the Walmart, to the subway that's inside of, of Walmart, gets an icy. You saw the video. Conley gets an icy. In fact, he left the jet. Then he leaves there, leaves Walmart, goes on Carl Ridge Drive, and he goes to McDonald's. And I think you remember the testimony, uh, I think it was Officer Leonard, uh, the McDonald's uh, is about one point uh, from where he was arrested. McDonald's is 1.8 miles from where he was arrested. He was arrested on Wyndham Lakes Boulevard. <coughs> So he goes down to McDonald's, and sitting in McDonald's at a table is John Wilford. Just so happens, John Wilford is the brother of Madeline Wilford, who was shot and wounded in classroom 1213. But the defendant didn't know John Wilford, and John Wilford didn't know the defendant, but the defendant walks up to him as he's sitting in the booth, and he starts talking, and he asks John Wilford for a ride, and John Wilford says, I can't give you a ride. My mom's picking me up. And sure enough, the mother came. They both get up. John Wilford walks out. The defendant follows him. John Wilford gets in his mom's car. The defendant crosses uh, Carl Ridge Drive into Wyndham Lakes and walks around. So he, uh, Officer Leonard spots him and arrests him at approximately 12.40 p.m. So the place of arrest was 1.8 miles from the McDonald's and 2.9 miles from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, and he's placed under arrest. So when crime scene from the Broward Sheriff's Office comes, uh, yeah, they obviously find, remember they found the video with the three video, the cell phone videos on it in the east stairwell. They find the Cabela bag in the east stairwell. Well, they also find, uh, obviously, the rifle, the 5.56 Smith & Wesson M&P 15 had a round in the chamber, as you probably know, with a semi-automatic, you know, once something, uh, uh, a round goes out the barrel, another one pops in. So there was a round in the uh, chamber, and there were 23 rounds still in the magazine. And the magazine, it was that, that was the magazine with a swastika on either side of it. Well, in that magazine, there were 23 rounds. Of the 23 rounds, guess what? 11 of them were tracer rounds. So, and in the best, there were five uh, magazines. There was a 40 round magazine, you know, in the, the tactical vest in one of the pouches. There was a, a 40 round magazine that was fully loaded with 40 rounds. There were three 30 round magazines that were fully loaded with 30 rounds. And there was a 20, uh, another 30 round magazine that had 29 rounds in it. And in one of those magazines, there was another nine tracer rounds. Now, uh, remember uh, George Bellow? He was the firearms expert. He says, I can tell a tracer round when it's full because of the orange tip and how, it, how it's manufactured. But once it's fired, I can't tell if any of the casings that were found of the 139 casings, if any of them were tracer rounds. But 
There were 11 tracer rounds in the magazine that was in the gun, and another nine tracer rounds there were in one of the magazines that was found in the vest. The police also found three magazines on the first floor, an empty 10-round magazine, an empty 30-round magazine, and another magazine in the hallway that was a 30-round magazine that had nine rounds in it that hadn't been fired. On the third floor, there was an empty 30-round magazine in the third floor hallway, and you can see in the video him reloading on the third floor, and there was a 40-round empty magazine in uh, the teacher's lounge at, at, uh, at 1240, so that was an empty 40-round. So there were five empty, mag well, five magazines, four of them were empty, one had nine rounds in it. Uh, and of course, there was 23 rounds in, well, actually 24, it was one in the chamber in, in, in the rifle that he left behind. So he carried out his plan. And his plan was, and he told everybody what his plan was. They found the, the, his phone and the cell phone uh, with three cell phone videos on it. And the one that he made on February the 11th, 2018, Hello, my name is Nick. I'm going to be the next school shooter of 2018. My goal is to kill at least 20 people with an AR and a couple of tracer rounds. I think I can get it done. Location, Stoneman Douglas in Parkland, Florida. It's going to be a big event. And when you see me on the news, you'll know who I am. Ha ha, you're all going to die. Can't wait. Can't wait. That was his plan. He carried it out. So you're going to see that in these proceedings, and we talk about it, aggravating and mitigating circumstances. The state is limited uh, about of the aggravating factors that uh, can, can be... Um, they can rely on by Florida statutes. And in this case, uh, we're limited to seven aggravating factors. And before I discuss the aggravating factors, Aaron, I'd like to play the video, please. <coughs> this is not to be published to the public, yeah. correct? Not to the public. Not, not to be published to the public. Right. 